Good evening and welcome to this Humane Philosophy Ian Ramsey Centre seminar. We're very, very glad to be starting these up again after a two-year break uh, caused by reasons familiar to everyone in the world. Uh, but we're back here and uh, we're very, very happy to uh, be starting with uh, a fantastic lecture uh, by a speaker who will be introduced by my colleague. Uh, just before that happens, I'd like to thank all of our uh, sponsors uh, and the institutions who have contributed to the success of the Humane Philosophy uh, Project, the Ian Ramsey Centre uh, 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 at the University of Oxford, the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw, and of course the institution that houses us this evening, Blackfriars Hall at the University of Oxford. And to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, my colleague Ralph Weir uh, will say a few words uh, to those of you um, who um, unexplicably might not be familiar uh, with who is going to be talking this evening. Thank you, Mikwai. You, you were in charge of, there was meant to be a big advertisement for the Humane Philosophy Project behind us, but in fact, this event is apparently sponsored by Optima DLP Projection System. We think it's the best projection system out there. We, we you know, <laughs> recommend you try it out. All right, well, as Mikwai uh, uh, implies, our speaker, of course, needs no introduction. Richard Swinburne is a fellow of the British Academy. From 1985 to 2002, he was professor of philosophy of religion here at the University of Oxford. He's written books on epistemic justification, the existence of God, free will, the mind-body problem, and all kinds of other fascinating and interesting issues it's not going too far to say that he is, without a doubt, one of the most important and influential philosophers alive today. So please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've all got a handout, I hope. Um, uh, you may need it to follow some of what I'm going to say. Uh, it's largely, most of it's concerned with what I shall say in the second part of the lecture, but the first paragraph summarizes what I shall say in the first part. This lecture is about what it is for someone to have free will, in the sense of free will in which those who have free will in choosing which intentional actions to do are morally responsible for those actions. An intentional action is an action which a person does meaning to do it. Not all attempts to do actions succeed, and one is just as morally responsible for what one tries to do as for what one succeeds in doing. And I will call what one succeeds in doing or tries to do but fails one's intention in acting. As the title of this lecture indicates, I am assuming that the kind of free will which makes an agent morally responsible is what is called libertarian free will. That is, that an intention is free if and only if the agent is not causally determined to form that intention by all the causes influencing them to form the intention. That is to say, causes may influence but do not fully determine. I shall discuss the desirability of different kinds of libertarian free will, so defined, which different creatures might have, and what would constitute evidence for or against humans, humans having free will of each kind. I now suggest that agents are subject to two and only two kinds of influence, as they choose whether or not to form an intention to do some action desires and moral beliefs. I am understanding a moral belief in a very wide sense as a belief about the overall goodness or badness of an action, overall goodness and all badness of an action, when all its good and bad aspects, both its goodness and bad or badness for the agent and its goodness or badness for all other agents and their relative importance are taken into account to yield an overall goodness or badness. I'm understanding moral goodness or badness as overall goodness or badness. I am understanding an agent having a desire to do some action as having a felt inclination to do that action, a felt inclination quite apart from whether they believe that it is good or not good to do the action. I shall call one moral belief stronger than another belief 
if the agent believes it more important to do the former than to do the latter. I shall call one desire stronger than another desire to do some action, if and only if the agent desires more to do the former than to do the latter. This division of conscious intentions into action, this division of conscious inclinations to action into, on the one hand, desires, and on the other hand, moral beliefs, is a natural one, because these are influences on an agent's conduct of very different kinds. Desires are felt urges to benefit oneself or those for whom one feels some affection, whereas moral beliefs are beliefs about the constraint imposed on our actions by a realm of goodness and, in particular, obligation, quite independent of our feelings. It then follows that when someone has beliefs of equal strength, equal strength about what, which of two or more incompatible actions would be morally best to do, inevitably they form an intention to do the one they have the strongest desire to do, if they have one strongest desire, or they choose arbitrarily between equal strongest desires. And when someone has desires of equal strength about which of two or more incompatible actions to do, inevitably they form the intention to do the action which they believe to be morally best, if there is such an action, or choose arbitrarily between actions believed to be equal best. Hence, the need for choice only arises when someone is faced with two or more incompatible, equally desired actions which they believe to be of equal moral strength. That's one circumstance where the need for choice arises. Or, other circumstance, with two incompatible actions, one of which they desire to do more and one of which they believe would be morally better to do. It is only in these two situations that we need to make a choice. And since we cannot be held morally responsible for our choices in the former situation, that is, where our desires are of equal strength and our moral beliefs are of equal strength, we just have to toss out what to do. Since we cannot be held morally responsible for our choices in the former situation, I will confine my discussion of free will to the latter situation where there is a choice between us fulfilling our strongest desire and fulfilling our strongest moral belief. That desires and moral beliefs are the two and only two conflicting proximate influences on an agent's choice of actions can be seen from examples. Suppose that faced with the choice between eating a cucumber sandwich and eating a piece of chocolate cake, when I believe that the former would be the morally better thing to do, perhaps because I believe I have a moral obligation not to become obese, if I believe that the former, eating the cucumber sandwich, would be the morally better thing, if I choose in that situation to eat the chocolate cake, suppose I do, then I can be justifiably very confident that I wouldn't have chosen to eat the cake unless I had had a strong desire to eat the cake. Without that desire, I would have acted in accord with my belief that it would be morally better to eat the sandwich. If there had been some other cause, unknown to me, influencing me to eat the cake without influencing my desires or beliefs, then I might have chosen to eat the cake even if I did not in any way desire to eat the cake, and that's implausible. If, on the other hand, I had resisted the desire to eat the cake under the influence of my moral belief, I know that I would not have failed to eat the cake without having that moral belief, and that no other cause would have made me not eat the cake except by affecting my desire to eat it. That is to say, we know and we have a choice between fulfilling our moral beliefs and fulfilling our desires, uh, that if we didn't have any desires on the matter, we'd certainly follow our moral belief. If we didn't have any moral beliefs on the matter, we'd certainly follow our desires, and there isn't anything that would stop us following our desires in the second case, or would stop us following our moral belief in the first case. I suggest that what holds for this example holds generally, and so that an action wouldn't be an intentional action 
unless the causes which influenced the agent's choice to, 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 of what to do influenced it by via their desires and moral beliefs. Wouldn't be an intentional action if its causes were not either its desires or moral beliefs. Although, as Tim Bain has pointed out, I quote, there is an extensive body of research in cognitive science detailing a myriad of ways in which our actions and decisions are influenced by factors of which we are not conscious. That's true. Um, but all the same, we are only morally responsible for forming an intention to act on our strongest desire or alternatively on our strongest belief. It is irrelevant whether our desires and beliefs are formed by factors of which we are ignorant. That is to say, all sorts of things may make us have a particular desire or have a particular moral belief, but we're not responsible for those. <laughs> we are just responsible for our choice in the moment of choice. And at that point, those are the two things influencing us. All the work of psychologists and so on into the more remote causes of our desires and beliefs are irrelevant to the issue of whether we have free will. Clearly, agents can assess whether one desire is stronger than another. If they ignore moral considerations, they know what they want more or equally. It's just the way it feels to them. We know what we want. We know what we desire. And clearly agents can assess whether one moral belief is stronger than another. It's just what they believe about what are the moral truths external to the agent. We know what's our strongest desire. We know what's our strongest moral belief. Agents feel the pressure of both influences, and they are aware of themselves as having to choose between them. And although some desires feel stronger than other desires and some moral beliefs feel more important than other moral beliefs, clearly also agents have no way of attributing a precise numerical strength either to a desire or to a moral belief. Nor do agents have any way, way of comparing the strength of a moral belief with the strength of a desire. We may know we, this is our strongest moral belief and that's our strongest moral desire, but we have no way of comparing their strength, and we certainly can't give it a numerical value. But although we can't give it a numer these things a numerical value, they may have precise strengths, even if we cannot assess them, as it were, uh, from inside. They may have precise moral strengths on a common scale, measurable by the objective probability that they will produce an effect. So that if the strongest desire is stronger than the strongest moral belief, it is objectively moral, more probable that the agent will form the intention to do what they desire. And conversely, when the strongest moral belief is stronger than the strongest desire, then the agent will form the intention to follow their strongest moral belief. That's to say we can't, yeah, from the inside, assess these strengths. But clearly there is a sense in which they might have strengths in that the stronger it is, the more probable it will be to act on them. By there being an objective, often called a physical or natural, probability of forming some event, I mean a propensity or bias in the system which causally influences it to produce that event. I shall assume for the moment that these probabilities, and so their strengths, do have precise values, although we may not know what they are. But later in the lecture, I shall consider the possibility that these probabilities and strengths may not have precise values. Beliefs and desires are both passive strengths, sight states. At some particular time, one finds oneself desiring to do some action, and one finds oneself believing an envisaged action to be morally good or bad, as the case may be. They're not things we do, they're things we find ourselves with. Uh, of course, in the long run, we may be able to make a difference to them, but at the time of choice, we've got the desires we have, we've got the beliefs we have. For that reason, because they're passive states, it is plausible that these desires and beliefs are caused, 
either deterministically or with some objective probability less than one, directly or indirectly by our brain events. And of course, these brain events are themselves caused by our genes and life history. So, I am suggesting the following model of how agents form their intention to do one rather than the other of two incompatible actions. In the simple case, where one action is believed to be morally best and the other is most desired. This total process consists of two separate processes, from a brain event to a desire belief complex, that's to say, a collection of your desires and beliefs with their different strengths, and from a desire belief complex to an intention. Uh, this is a total process governed insofar as it is governed by an overall natural law. This law determines the objective probability that different brain events will cause with different degrees of objective probability, different desire belief complexes, in which the strongest moral belief and the strongest de desire may differ in strength. The first part of the process is brain events cause us no doubt the brain events caused by all sorts of other things in the past, cause us to have a desire-belief complex, a set of desires and beliefs uh, with different strengths. So let us assess, uh, assign, and this is on your handout, let us assign a strength of one to the complex if necessarily it will cause the agent to act on their moral belief and zero to the complex if necessarily it will cause the agent to act on their strongest desire. And now we start on the second paragraph. Strengths of the complex intermediate, intermediate between one and zero measure the degree to which it's more probable that the complex will lead to the agent acting on their strongest moral belief than on their strongest desire. The closer, if the, if the complex has a strength of a two-thirds, then it's twice as likely that they will act on their uh, strongest moral belief than on their strongest desire. If it's one-third, it's much more likely they'll act on their strongest desire, much more probable. That is, there's bias in the system is towards that. The closer the value of the, the strength of the complex, the harder it will be for an agent to resist the temptation to do the most desired action. So, the probability that some brain event will lead to a certain intention is a function of two probabilities. The probability that the brain event will cause a certain desire-belief complex and the probability that the desire-belief complex will lead to that intention. The overall probability that the brain event will lead to a certain intention is then the sum of the probabilities of each of the different routes that is, via different desire-belief complexes with different strengths by which it could lead to that intention. We've got the model. Two separate processes from brain events to desires and belief complexes, from desires and belief complexes to intentions. And it's the second process that our free will, if we've got it, depends on. Now, take a very simple example to fill that out. Suppose that the law which determines the biases of things, has the consequence that there are only two possible values of the strength of the desire-belief complex, one-third and two-thirds. And suppose that for a certain uh, brain state, there is a probability of two-thirds that that brain state will cause the desire-belief complex with the strength of a third, and a probability of a third that it will cause that desire that it will cause the desire-belief complex with a strength of zero. That is to say, if there are two routes to the intention, uh, the probability that a certain brain event will lead to that intention, um, there are two ways of getting there, getting there via a certain desire-belief complex with a certain strength, and that in turn uh, makes it probable, according to the size of the strength, that you'll have that intention, alternatively, a different desire-belief complex, which will get to the same way, only in a different route. 
in that case, in the case of my simple example, it doesn't matter if you haven't got the maths in your mind, uh, it, but in that particular example, there will be a probability of two-thirds times one-third plus a third times zero, and that will add up to seven out of nine. That's the, those brain states, that original brain state, will lead to the formation of an intention to do the action most desired, and therefore two-ninths, that it will lead to formation of intention to do the moral action. So, more generally, given that the complex can have a strength of one or naught, or any strength in between these, then for each total brain state, B1, including all the brain events which causally influence the complex, doesn't matter if you can follow, you need to follow this, where Q is the probability that B1 will cause a complex of strength R, then the probability that the agent will form the moral intention as opposed to the most desired in intention is the integral of P2 for all possible values of P and Q. Okay, I hope you've got the model, if not the details. Do you start with a brain? Different brain events, uh, any particular brain event will give different probabilities to um, a different desired belief complex, which is in turn, the greater their strength, the more probable it will be that they will lead to the moral intention and the less probable to the other intention. Given all that, there are now, for every a uh, satis way of satisfying the model, two different kinds of way in which these processes which I've described might operate, varied, varying with the kind of things that desires, beliefs, and intentions are. And that's where we are on the second paragraph. The first kind of... All, these are all processes in which have the formal shape that I have described. The first kind is one where the desires, beliefs, and intentions are simply brain events, or necessarily supervenient on them. In that case, the causal succession from brain event to desire, belief, complex to intention is a succession of brain events, BS1 leading to BS2, the desire, belief, complex, leading to BS3, the intention. And therefore, because it is a succession of brain events, will be governed by purely physical laws. And these physical laws will determine how probable it is for each original brain state, BS1, that it will cause BS2 with a certain strength, and that uh, the strength is the probability that it will cause even each of the different intentions, only their brain states, um, and these laws, uh, determining these causal successions, will be the laws of physics. And if they're such that necessarily every BS1, the original brain state, will cause the next B brain state, the desire and belief uh, complex, with a certain strength, or that it will cause it with a different strength, then uh, if it will the laws are such that it will cause every uh, desire-belief complex to have a st either a state of uh, strength of one or a strength of naught, then necessarily our actions will be determined because if the brain state causes the desire-belief complex always to have a probability of one, then inevitably we will do the moral action. And if it is such as to cause the desire-belief complex to have a value of naught, then inevitably we will do the desired action. And in that case, if for all brain states that's how it is, then we don't have free will. But if these laws, either from the... Then remember, we're talking there are brain states all the time. If these laws from the first brain state to the second brain state, which is the desire-belief complex, to the third brain state, which is the intention. If these laws allow the f some BS1s to cause BS2s with strengths intermediate between one and naught, then in those cases, 
humans will have free will to choose which intention to form. I have introduced this first kind of free will in order that my analysis of libertarian free will is available to physicalists as well as to dualists. My own view, which there is no space to discuss here, is that desires, beliefs, and intentions are necessarily not supervenient on brain events. They are mental events logically independent of them, but causally influenced by them. On this dualist view, the two separate processes, from brain events to desire-belief complexes, and from desire-belief complexes to intentions, are governed by non-physical laws of a kind totally unknown to contemporary physics. They must be unknown to contemporary physics because contemporary physics doesn't deal in intentions and desires and beliefs. So, they will be um, the first, the law from brain state to desire-belief complex. You could call it a physico-mental law. And the second law from desire-belief complex to intentions, a mental-to-mental -mental law. Now, if that's the situation, agents, again, will have free will whenever the first law has the consequence that some brain events cause desire-belief complexes of strengths intermediate between one and zero. And in that case, for those brain states, there will be only in a probability intermediate between one and zero that the desire-belief complex will lead to a particular intention and so it remains open to the agent to form whichever intention he or she chooses. Okay, we're now down to uh, about four lines from the bottom of the first page. If the latter, uh, that is to say these probabilities that the brain state will lead to desire-belief complex, desire-belief complex will lead to intention, if these probabilities, uh, uh, we ask, um, may be either uh, one, zero, or intermediate value. But it's the latter stage, the stage from um, desire-belief complex to intention, um, if that uh, probability arising from the strength of the complex is of the normal numerical kind, and so the probability of an intention of a given kind in identical circumstances, that is, when caused by a qualitatively identical desire-belief complex on each occasion, then we have the problem to which Peter van in Wagen drew our attention in his rollback argument. Sorry, I moved too quickly there. Go back. Um, just get the idea that if they, these desires and beliefs are separate from um, brain events. And the, the succession of, again, two, there are two separate processes, and each may have its own probability. One probability that the brain state will cause the com certain complex, another probability, which measures the strength of the complex, that it will move from there to an intention. Th then, um, it's only the second process on which our free will depends, uh, because it's only the second process that d is governed by desires and when desires and beliefs are influencing us that uh, we uh, have, have to make choices. And um, I'm assuming for the moment that this probability is of the normal numerical kind, uh, every, everything I've said so far implies that. It might be a half or it might be two-thirds. It has a definite bias built in. Um, and so, um, it would seem, uh, if it has a definite bias built in, uh, each time that a desire, uh, a belief complex of a certain sort is formed, it, it has a particular bias built into it. Uh, and this bias is caused by the way it's formed, then uh, each time a qualitatively identical desire-belief complex is formed, one with the same desires and beliefs of the same strength, then um, we, have, uh, we ought to be able to calculate 
what is the probability of if you make a lot of, if you are millions of times in this situation, uh, what, how probable it will be that many of the choices will be of one kind and many of another. And so if there's an identity, if this a particular brain stage is repeated innumerable times, then uh, you can work out uh, if it's biased towards the moral belief on one occasion is uh, two-thirds, then you can work out how probable it will be that if you repeat it a million times, uh, there will be a probability uh, or there will be so and so many uh, uh, moral choices formed. And Peter Van in Wagen imagined this situation in what he called his rollback argument. And the rollback argument is, if a qualitatively identical cause, which is the desire belief complex, occurs a large number of times, it is objectively very probable indeed that the proportion of times on which the effect occurs will correspond very closely to the probability of it occurring on any one occasion. For example, if a desire-belief complex has a strength of two-thirds, and so there's a probability of two-thirds that it will cause the agent to choose the morally best intention, then there's a very high probability indeed that if that particular desire complex is instantiated a million times, it will cause the agent to form that intention on some number of occasions fairly close to 666,667. So, as Van in Wagen suggested, it, this is his words, as Van in Wagen suggested, it might seem to be a matter of chance that on any one actual occasion on which these desires and beliefs occurred was one on which the agent formed the morally best intention rather than one on the, which they did not. If you, <laughs> as it were, it must be a matter of chance that you caught the agent in that situation where um, uh, it was of a particular kind. Hence the objection, Benny Wagen's objection, that it, despite it initially seeming otherwise, this kind of freedom would not give agents moral responsibility for their actions. For, he said, how can one justifiably praise or blame an agent for doing some action just because the actual occasion was one on which he or she formed the relevant intention rather than one on which they did not form that intention. On the other hand, on this theory, except in those cases, of course, where the complex has a probability of one or naught, on this theory, an agent's actual choice in the actual circumstances in which they find themselves is in no way totally determined. It's still up to the agent, if there's a two-thirds bias, it's still up to the agent whether or not they conform to or resist the balance of mental forces acting upon them. That is to say, if the probability is two-thirds and it's just a bias in the system, uh, eh, you have to fight, ha, uh, that's your, your inclination is, is then for two-thirds strength to do the moral, action, and so you don't need to fight hard against the temptation to do the other one. But of course, if the strength is the other way around, you do have to fight hard not to do the um, desired action. So it's up to, still up to the agent, I suggest, whether or not they conform to or resist the balance of mental forces acting upon them. Surely agents are morally responsible only for the intentions they actually form and not for the ones they probably would form if they were in exactly the same situation innumerable times, which in practice they never will be. So, different philosophers, and I can quote intuitions on both sides, different philosophers have different intuitions about whether free will of this type gives agents moral responsibility for their actions. While my own intuition is that, on this theory, agents would still be morally responsible for any particular action, I do accept that the nature of choices made under the pressure of a fixed bias resulting from the relative strengths of our desires and moral beliefs 
does constitute a limitation on our freedom. It is possible to avoid this disadvantage of the second kind of free will if we suppose that desires and moral beliefs are not things of a kind which have precise numerical strengths other than one or not. In that case, the, <laughs> the only law uh, would be a law determining that a certain kind of brain event would produce a complex with a certain strongest disease desire and the strongest moral belief, but that complex would not, unless it had a probability of one or not, have a particular numerical strength, giving, in consequence, an exact desire or exact degree of objective probability that an agent would form one intention rather than the other. Uh, Alan Hayek uh, has argued that for many events, I quote, including perhaps free actions, close quote, there is no probability that they will occur or that they will not occur. And Lara Buchak rightly claimed that Van in Wagen was not entitled to make the assumption that undetermined human choices of intention have fixed biases. I suggest that it is in no way implausible to suppose that if desires and beliefs do not supervene on brain events, they do not have strengths with precise numerical values. We all know how arbitrary is any answer we can give to a question of the form, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you desire it? Well, it's pretty arbitrary, and we, we seem to report you know, how it is internal to us. Pretty arbitrary. However, Given that agents sometimes act on their strongest desire of some kind and sometimes act on their strongest moral belief of some kind, we can speak of a desire-belief complex giving a non-numerical probability less than one to the occurrence of some intention in the sense that it provides a necessary but not sufficient condition for the occurrence of the intention and is sometimes followed by that intention. So, I'm suggesting we can have a sense of uh, probability in which um, probabilities do not have exact values. And to say uh, that uh, some brain state causes a desire belief complex of a certain sort, which gives a certain problem, which gives a probability to the occurrence of an intention, is merely to say on this view that the desire belief complex is such that its occurrence is necessary for the occurrence of the intention, and also that, um, uh, also that uh, the intentions of that sort do sometimes follow from it. I will give, call a theory in which brain events do not give numerical probabilities, other than one or not, to the desires and beliefs which they cause and so that these desires and beliefs have no particular numerical strengths which determine a numerical probability, I will call such a theory a theory of the third kind. And therefore, the, on this theory, there will be no particular probability that an agent will form an intention of any particular kind. There will be no bias in the system. However, there would be a different disadvantage in having free will of this cursed third kind. Having a certain moral character uh, consists not merely in having certain desires and moral beliefs, but in having moral desires and moral beliefs of certain strengths relative to each other. That is to say, uh, somebody, two persons, one of whom we would naturally call getting on for a saint, and the other of which we would call something getting on for a demon, uh, might have the same moral beliefs and uh, the same uh, desires, uh, but one would have very strong, very strong uh, moral beliefs and fairly weak contrary desires, and conversely, the other way around. Uh, and so having a character consists in having uh, not merely certain desires and moral beliefs, but in having moral beliefs of certain strengths relative to each other. 
Now, it's generally believed that humans are such that if they form an intention to do an action of a certain kind which they believe to be morally the best on one occasion when they have a contrary desire, that makes it easier for them to form an intention of that kind next time when they are in a similar situation. And conversely, if they yield to temptation on one occasion, it will be harder to resist it on another occasion. Uh, that is to say, it's generally believed uh, that uh, if you do an action of one sort one time, it's easier to, when it's difficult, it's easier to do it next time, and easier still to do it next time, and so on. And that's the way you can form your character. Um, now, if an agents are in this way similar to humans, and if humans are like that, then over time we would gradually be able to form either a very good character or allow ourselves to acquire a very bad character. But on a theory of this third kind, where, numeric, where desires and beliefs don't have any particular strengths um, on the same scale as each other or, or at all, um, agents couldn't make a difference to their characters because there wouldn't be a difference between someone whose moral beliefs were very strong and someone whose moral beliefs weren't very strong. Yet surely it is a great good for agents if they can mold their character for good or ill. It's great good for us if we can, by our effort, make ourselves better people or make ourselves worse people. That wouldn't be possible on a theory of the third kind. But it is possible on a theory of the first or second kind. So total control, which is what the third kind of theory suggests, total control over present choices entails total lack of control over future choices. And for this reason, my intuition is that freedom of the second kind is better for an agent than freedom of the first kind. So what I've done so far is to firstly try to persuade you that the only relevant influences on our choices are our desires and beliefs. And I have given you a model of how uh, they influence us, is brain states, produce different desire belief complexes, desire belief complexes produced if, or lead to or make, make probable certain intentions. And I have suggested that there are three ways, three kinds of theory which would uh, for, fall into that pattern. Uh, I'm now going on in the last part of the lecture to consider what kind of evidence we can have for or against the view that we do or don't have libertarian free will of one or the other kind. On the physicalist view, which I have incorporated into my first kind of free will, the only laws involved are the same physical laws as operate outside the body. So in the course of time, neuroscientists ought to be able to reach a well-established conclusion about whether the particular sorts of brain events which of course will be events over a large area of the brain, whether the particular sort of brain events necessary for the production of particular desires and beliefs and thereby of intentions make it necessary or only probable that the intention will be of a certain kind. It may turn out that the laws, including the ones governing the crucial second stage, are in fact quantum the laws of quantum theory and uh, the brain is so organized that small uh, variations within a brain state of a quantum kind uh, do, may, uh, do not give probabilities of one or naught to us doing certain actions but allow for intermediate probabilities. That might happen. But so uh, if it were the case, and I think it isn't the case, if it were the case that uh, desires, beliefs, etc were just brain states, uh, science had a good chance of working it all out, which the situation is. Not, of course, tomorrow, but in the course of uh, many decades. But on the other two theories, desires and beliefs cannot be observed publicly. Their strength cannot be measured in the way that it could on the, on the first theory. 
And so the only relevant public evidence about their influences on our intentions must come from the work of neuroscientists on the extent of the correlations between the brain events which cause our desires and beliefs and the intentions which the desires and beliefs cause. That is to say, <laughs> on the dualist view, the desires and beliefs are not, unlike on the physicalist view, things scientists can look at and measure. So all the scientists can look at and measure are the first stage of the process, the brain events which cause our desires and beliefs, and the last stage of the process, the intention which we form. And, but they can measure whether the, the brain events of different kinds at the first stage are correlated with different intentions at the last stage. And this sort of work is going on. It's the kind of work currently being pursued by the program initiated by Benjamin Libet in the 1980s, in which some non-invasive method is used to discover which brain events influence in one view, us to form intentions to do one or other alternate actions. That is to say, the scientists can observe what's going on in the brain, uh, and they can't observe the desires and beliefs, but they can observe what intentions come out at the end, and they can work out whether these are, how far these are correlated with one another. And lots of experimental work has gone on. In various experiments, such as those of Soon and others, 2008, 2013, and Freed, 2013, subjects were formed, instructed to form an intention at the they were told to form an intention to press one of two buttons or to make two, one or two mental acts and immediately thereafter to report at what time, as measured by a fast-moving clock, they formed the intention. And experimenters found significant correlations of 60 to 80 percent between different patterns of brain events several seconds before the formation of the intention at which time presumably they would have had relevant desires and beliefs and the particular intentions subsequently formed. So, uh, they've got these rows of students uh, uh, set up and they put apparatus on their heads and uh, they said, uh, in the next 20 seconds, uh, you must form an intention either to move your right hand or to move your left hand. And uh, uh, the students did what they were told, and um, they were then told as they formed the intention uh, to note the time at which they formed the intention on a very fast clock and to report it afterwards. And the apparatus on their head was studying their brain events all the time, and uh, the scientists found correlation between certain sorts of brain events and their moving their left hand and certain other sorts of brain events with their moving their right hand. Some of you, I'm sure, know this stuff already. Um, and uh, the degree of causal influence. And so, uh, uh, presumably, the brain events uh, beforehand uh, indicated uh, were at the stage in which they would have had desires and beliefs. And so uh, this indicated a significant degree of causal influence by prior brain uh, events via, of course, in my view, via desire-belief complexes on which intentions are chosen. But it did not show either of the two processes involved to be deterministic. That is to say, since the correlation was merely 60 or 80 percent uh, between that, this is perfectly compatible with one of the processes being deterministic and the other not, or conversely, or both being indeterministic. Um, but it might turn, and at any rate, it's only 60 to 80 percent. Um, but it might turn out that as more and more brain areas and individual neuron firings are taken into account, Scientists can find a pattern uh, which gives more and more accurate correlations of these brain events with the subsequent intentions, perhaps, that scientists might begin to find that it's 90 or 95 percent between a certain brain event and subsequent intentions. 
And that would make it epistemically probable that if you went on more and studying a larger and larger brain event, more and more detail, more and more often, you, you might find 100% correlations between brain events of a certain kind and subsequent intentions. And that, of course, would make it epistemically very probable that the processes of the kind studied are deterministic. And so it would show that both the processes of brain events causing desire belief complexes and desire belief complexes causally influencing intentions are deterministic. And so it would show that humans do not have libertarian free will of any kind when making choices of the kind so far studied. If you really got to deterministic correlations between brain state beforehand and intention afterwards, then both processes would have to be deterministic, and that would include the last process. And so we would be predetermined to make those particular choices. The trouble is that the kinds of studies done, move your right hand or move your left hand, or one or two somewhat more complicated ones, are all ones in which subjects wouldn't consider that it would be morally better to form one intention rather than the other. And so inevitably they act on their strongest or equal strongest desires. And of course, that's what I admitted at the beginning. And uh, for this reason, as has been pointed out by very many commentators, the kind of choice involved in these experiments is so different from that involved in making choices between actions which subjects desire to do more and actions which they believe to be morally better to do that one cannot extrapolate from the result of these experiments to any conclusion about our freedom in making serious moral choices. Now, there are obvious practical and ethical problems in organizing a study where the choices are serious moral choices. You're not going to put something on their, somebody's head all the time. They're trying to work out whether they've got a vacation or not. Um, and um, there are obvious problems in that. But if and when such studies are done, and if and when their results showed correlations of the kind found in Libet-type experiments beginning to approach 100%, then a similar deterministic conclusion should be drawn. But suppose, on the contrary, that in some situations of serious moral choice for any particular pattern of brain activity prior to the formation of the subject's intention, always a significant number of subjects form one intention and a significant number of subjects form a different intention, and that this remains the case however detailed is the pattern of neural activity studied. In that case, the next issue is whether in more and more studies of the effect of any particular initial brain event, the proportion of choices of the moral intention over the desired intention converges on a particular value, for example, two-thirds. By converges on a particular value, I mean you find if you do 100 studies, then uh, 66 of them show uh, um, uh, the formation of the moral intention. But if you go on doing a million, then the same proportion holds. It, it would, and it gets closer and closer to two-thirds the more and more studies you make. Uh, suppose you do find that um, although uh, there's no deterministic correlation between the first stage and the last stage, nevertheless, the proportion of intentions does converge on a particular value. And that would be evidence of a constant probabilistic bias, either in the first process involved, or in the second process involved, or in both. But in order to show that humans have libertarian free will of the second kind, we would have to show that the indeterministic nature of the overall transmission was not due to indeterminism only in the first process. That is to say, if you have 
by uh, finding that there are that it converges on a particular value, that shows that there are certain fixed biases in the system uh, for in both of the processes, one or other of the processes involved. But you wouldn't be, know, be able to know which process was the trouble. This, is per this result would be perfectly compatible with total determinism of our choices by our desires and beliefs, so long as the process of causing our desires and beliefs was itself indeterministic, or conversely. And I cannot see how in that was the result of our experiments that we could possibly show that we do or do not have free will. It might, however, turn out that large studies of the effects of any initial brain event via a desire and belief complex on our intentions, the proportion of choices of the moral intention over the desired intention never converges on a particular value. That is to say, in the first thousand choices, uh, studies, you might find um, uh, 660 of them were choices of the moral, and then in the next hundred you might find only 30 choices of the moral, and it never converges. That is a possible result. Of course, you can't go on forever, but if you go on long enough, that's, that is some evidence of what would happen if you went on forever. And that would show that there is no totally no total numerically measurable bias in the overall process. And since the first part of the process, from brain states to desires and beliefs, is clearly similar to any scientific law in the respect that passive events, brain events, cause other passive events, desires and beliefs, nobody supposes that the desires and beliefs are caused actively at the time, um, we have no reason to suppose that the deterministic, that there is not some deterministic or probabilistic law of the normal kind governing the first process. The first process is much more likely to have a, a, a constant, uh, have a numerical value to the probability because the events involved are the sort of uh, just passive events, things that happen uh, between which scientists find correlation. And it would therefore be more probable epistemically that the failure of the total process of brain events, of the process from brain events to intentions to have a numerical bias, much more likely that the, the, the trouble or why it doesn't, the total, didn't converge to a, uh, a definite value is due to the second part of the complex, the, the process from desire belief to intentions. And in that case, uh, we could conclude that we do have free will. And it's quite natural to suppose that, um, as I have commented already, that desires and beliefs don't have uh, exact numerical strengths. And if in that case, uh, there will be no numerical probability that the subject will form a particular intention. And in that case, we could conclude that humans have libertarian free will of the third kind. However, as I commented, humans do seem to a significant extent to be able to improve our characters or to let them get worse. And that suggests that we do not in fact have libertarian free will of this kind. So, for humans, the issue probably turns on whether we have libertarian free will of the second kind or no libertarian free will at all. But it seems to me that there would be very considerable difficulties in making enough studies of humans who have qualitatively identical brain states. You have to have a large number of studies to get a well-justified scientific result. So you need to have a large number of studies of people with exactly the same brain states, and that means quite, that's going to involve quite a lot of the brain, who do or don't form a certain intention. And it seems to me very, there will be very considerable difficulties in getting enough such uh, stu uh, studies. First, there is the difficulty that given that the uh, 
apparent fact that um, each time we make a choice that makes it more or e easier or less easy to make that choice next time, humans will ne a given human will never be in the same brain state. So you'd have to do the test on, diff on large numbers, many thousands of different humans you'd need to find who have exactly identical brain states. And that's immensely unlikely that you would find these, because I doubt if you would find any two humans who at any time have exactly the same brain state, but because the brain states involved in forming our desires and beliefs are, cover a very wide area of our brain. So I think it most unlikely <laughs> that we will ever be able to conduct a large enough series of studies to show whether humans have libertarian free will of any kind. However, we do have some hints of what is the right conclusion from our own experience of what is happening when we ourselves form an intention. And the best study of this name to me suggests that most people feel it's up to them whether or not they are choosing freely um, between satisfying their strongest desire and satisfying their strongest belief and that, I suspect, is the best we can do in this mortal life to find the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this extremely um, rich and engaging talk. Um, we've got uh, some time for questions. So what will happen is uh, Samuel Hughes here uh, will pass around the microphone. Please wait until the microphone gets to you before you ask your question, because as we've said previously, we do want to record both questions and answers. And uh, if you do want to ask a question, please raise your hand and uh, Ralph Weir will uh, uh, field, field the questions and point to you when it's your turn. So please wait for the microphone to get to you, and please wait for Ralph Weir to point you out as the person asking the question. Well, I, I think well, Nick Blackhorn is here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Um, I, I had a question um, about your saying that our belief desire complex when it's say one third rather than two thirds and so biases to us towards acting on the desire rather than on the moral belief. Uh, you said we'd have to fight harder to choose to act on our moral belief. Um, and my question is what grounds the strength of that fighting that we do? Uh, I know it's a metaphor but um, uh, the, the, to, to elaborate a little bit, um, I presume that there's some definite point in fighting strength which allows us to overcome our desire on a complex with two-thirds probability. Um, but what grounds whether we fight with the relevant level of strength to overcome it? Um, if there's nothing that grounds it, it seems that uh, I'm just it's random whether I fight with enough strength or, or not, and then it doesn't seem morally praiseworthy for me to do so. If I'm necessitated, then it doesn't seem that I'm morally praiseworthy to do so. And if it's another probability, then it seems that I have to fight to overcome, to get to the level of overcoming that probability or not, and thus a regress beckons. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more about what grounds are fighting. Uh, yes. Um, well, I suggest, first of all, we do all find uh, at least I find, I really think most people find, uh, some temptations are very hard to resist and others are a great deal less hard to resist. Um, uh, give, but of course that internally is all that we can find and uh, it's natural to describe this situation as one in which uh, in the first case where the temptations are hard to resist, in which to, the, to describe it as the situation in which our, um, uh, des moral, our desires uh, are strong, uh, are strong, and our um, moral beliefs are weak. Now, as I said, internally we cannot compare these, but we can, of course, compare one desire with another, and I can say, well, um, this desire is a lot stronger than that desire. I don't have that desire at the moment, but this is the one that uh, I feel very strongly about, and it was I feel about it a lot that more strongly than what I feel about another desire yesterday. Um, so we do have an idea that some desires are stronger than another, and we can uh, note this internally. 
Likewise, we can note internally that we have some moral beliefs which are strong and some which are not. Um, uh, but, but I stress this internally, we can't uh, <laughs> give any measures uh, to these things other than perhaps one or not. Um, but um, I suggested it's not implausible to suppose they might in fact have values uh, and, uh, the, the, and values which are given by, uh, uh, shown by uh, the proportion of choices of the one sort that we uh, make um, in the same situation. That's what it would amount to. Um, uh, to say that it has a strength of two-thirds is to describe it as biased to that degree uh, in this situation. And the, the cash value of to that degree is that if it were repeated a large number of times, that is the proportion of choices you would get. Um, uh, uh, I was working on the assumption that that's what we could do um, or rather, <laughs> that it does have values which, in principle, could be discovered in that way. But if I'm wrong about this, that it doesn't have values which can be discovered in that way, then we fall into the third, uh, third kind of free will. I don't know if that answers, does it, or have I missed the point? Well, well we should let that answer for now, because oh. there are a few more questions lined up, but we might let Nicholas come back on that. The gentleman in the second row here, and then first row. Thank you for the talk. It won't make you louder. It's okay. Great. The, uh, um, so my question, um, I, it's kind of a two-part, but c could I indulge in a two-part question, or is it better to? Yeah. Okay, okay. So I guess the, the first um, question I had was just regarding, similar to the last question, but... Um, slightly different. So regarding the distinction between desire and moral belief that was central to your discussion of libertarian free will, if I remember correctly, um, you mentioned the choice between two equal desires as one option as well, in, in addition to the ch choice between a desire and a conflicting moral belief. Does this lead us then, if we, if we embrace this way of looking at, f at f libertarian free will, to the uncomfortable situation where we're more free the more we dislike the good or the more we don't desire to do good things right so so for example am i more free um that i didn't want to marry my wife but i married her because i felt it was a duty or am i more free because i really wanted to marry her as well perhaps equally that i also thought it was a duty so is there room for our desires to cohere? And this ties into your thoughts on character, right? So a good character, hopefully, is one that desires the good, right? So um, I'd, I'd be curious to get your thoughts there. And the other question I had was just regarding Van Invigen's, um rollback dilemma. Um, and it seemed to me that your response was to say that um, what matters is is, is the source of the, the choice, but so, so that um, it's not so much that the, um, let's say, psychophysical laws are not morally considerable um, factors of causation, right? But intention is, let's say. Um, but neither are laws of statistics and probability. Um, so I, I, would, I would wonder if what's important to you in responding to the rollback dilemma is that it's the intent and the source of the choice rather, uh, and like what, what role does the source play? Uh, as regards to the first point, um, uh, if we have a, a, a strongest desire which doesn't in any way conflict with our moral beliefs, um, we will automatically act on it. Um, uh, if you want to call that being not free, um, you can call it not being not free. But um, uh, moral responsibility is a, uh, uh, whether we can be held uh, accountable for our actions only arises in the case where there is a conflict between <laughs> strongest desire and strongest moral belief. And if uh, we find ourselves fortunately 
not I think for most of us in this world, but uh, I think it would be a feature of heaven that uh, uh, there, there isn't any more conflict and um, uh, our choices are only between alternate moral beliefs of, diff of, uh, equal, uh, of equal strength. Um, and that, of course, will be also the case um, on earth, uh, uh, that we often have that that choice, as well as the choice we have on earth of choosing between uh, the desires and beliefs. That is to say, we have meant, I do mention this, um, that there are two sorts of cases where we have to, uh, where we have uh, freedom. One is where our des we have equal desires, <laughs> desires of equal strengths and moral uh, uh, beliefs of equal strengths, and we just have to make an arbitrary choice. Well, we are free in that situation, sure, um, but that is um, not a. I mean, it doesn't matter much how we how we choose in that situation. But there it is a free situation, uh, undoubtedly on all theories. Um, but I was concerned with the situation which makes us. Um, morally responsible for our actions and so uh, makes us culpable or praiseworthy um, for doing them. And that it does involve a conflict. Um, and you, your situation is, the uh, question is, are, are you more free if you do <laughs> uh, what, um, if you choose in difficult circumstances than in easy circumstances? And um, apart from the situation where um, uh, the desires are of equal strength, the, my answer is yes, uh, we are more free in that situation. Uh, but so what? We're glad. Uh, it doesn't matter because uh, it's good to do what you want. It's good to do what you desire. If you find yourself with a desire to do this marvelous thing, uh, and no choice, not uh, no wish to do anything else, you will automatically do it. In my terminology, you're not free in that, but that's the situation where it's pretty good not to be free, and uh, let's leave it at that. Um, in the second uh, case, in, in the rollback case, um, it's my argument, and I say there are intuitions among philosophers, I could quote two or three on each, each side of the debate, um, there are those who say, well, um, uh, <laughs> if, if it's... Uh, but they have different pictures of what's going on. Those who, who say that um, if, if there's a fixed buy, a fixed chance, um, it's that there's a... Um, you... How shall I put it? Um, they have a picture of, as it were, you choosing a sort of a picture of all these possible worlds in which you are making these choices all being realized. And therefore, they say, uh, it, it's going to be rather a lucky accident whether one of these possible worlds is realized rather than the other one. And that's the intuition that drives the, the people who say um, the rollback shows that we are not really free. But those who say we are really free concentrate on the actual situation and don't imagine all these possible worlds. And they say, well, in the actual situation, it's just that we have a certain bias and it's strong in one, stronger to do one thing than the other, but we can fight against the strong uh, bias if we like. And I think that's the right way to, to look at it because uh, there aren't all these possible worlds. Uh, they don't exist um, uh, in which all these choices are, are made and, as it were, the investigator catches you in one of these possible worlds. None of these exist. And if you don't think in that way, you just think as regards the actual situation, then I think you do have uh, a genuine freedom. But, of course, it's, it does, uh, the bias does mean freedom's hard.
Thank you, Professor Swinburne. Um, <coughs> so my question is also related to a kind of van den Wagen rollback argument. But so the thought is, you have um, some uh, you, you assign an antecedent probability to the belief desire complex such that an agent fires two thirds of the time and then sighs one third of the time. Um, and the thought is, well, in order to um, in order to to respond to this kind of rollback argument, it has to be that the agent um, fights in some sense in order to um, choose to fire or to sigh. Um, to what extent do you see that the the f the fighting re is reducible to either the uh, beliefs uh, or the desires in terms of it, their competing um, probabilities in the belief desire complex? And if I mean, if they're <laughs> if, the, if if it is reducible, then it seems like you have a another kind of disappearing agent problem where it's just the case that the belief desire complex is results in the the outcome. <laughs> uh, it's just some choices are hard and some aren't uh, are not hard. Um, though to describe it in that way is a little misleading because it's a choice between uh, fighting to make the good the good choice and letting yourself make the bad choice. I mean, I think the situation of the, the really wicked person who says, evil be thou my good, I, uh, I don't believe that situation exists, but if it does exist, it's only a very few of bad people who are in this situation. I think uh, most of our bad choices are let, you know, uh, uh, Weakness of will, we just So it is a choice between, as it, well, we've got a, uh, making ourselves do the good choice and um, uh, letting ourselves do the bad choice. And um, that's what uh, the, the particular situation consists in. It doesn't consist in um, the coin going one way or another uh, as a man determined by law. It just, it's, it's, the law concerns an individual bias in a particular, each particular situation. And the bias is one you feel and you have to yield to or fight against. I mean, I did describe it that way on the basis of um, our internal awareness of what's going on. Yes. Thank you for such a rich and illuminating lecture. My question is about what you said at, uh, toward the beginning about belief as passive. And I was th many would describe or experience belief as being formed uh, in the midst of competing claims and involving elements of, of will, that, that, there's a, that our, the belief at which we arrive is an expression not just of something. In some cases, of course, we, we experience belief as something that we're very settled. But sometimes we have to reach towards belief, or we where belief feels like it's being chosen, a particular principle, uh, in relation to other competing claims. And I just wonder if that, that experience is, if I'm just m missing, uh, I mean, uh, if, if that experience can form part of, of your system, uh, of belief is not entirely passive, but in some way willed and chosen. No, I'm afraid I am totally convinced that uh, a belief is entirely passive. On that way, in that respect, Hume was right. Hume said exactly the same. Uh, what I, my argument for that is, is fairly quick. Um, if, as it were, you choose to believe P or not P, uh, you're aware of doing this. And therefore, you are aware that your choice has been that your be subsequent belief is the result of your choice, not the result of the facts impinging on you. And when you realize that it's not the result, and you would believe this whether or not the facts impinge on you, you can't really believe it. I might be stuck in 19th century debates uh, in the world of uh, John Henry Newman and uh, 
E.B. Pusey and John Keeble, but arguing, thinking about, uh, arguing precisely that belief is formed in the context of a trial, a moral trial. So there's a, there's, there's a element of the kind of belief at which we arrive as an expression of our character. Uh, yes, but um, two points. Firstly, I'm talking about belief that, belief that so and so is the case. I'm not talking about belief in, commitment to. You can believe, commit yourself to a system, and that is certainly a choice. And you're fairly sensible if you commit yourself to a system, which is probably true. But there's nothing wrong in committing yourself to a system which is probably false. And that is a commitment. I mean, obvious examples. Uh, if you want a million pounds and the only way of getting a million pounds is to win the lottery, uh, it's sensible to invest in the lottery. Even though you believe you won't win, you are putting your belief in the lottery in that sense. Um, but, um, so that's the first distinction I made. Now, secondly, of course, in, um, uh, we uh, uh, normally go through a process of looking at the evidence uh, before uh, we come to beliefs. But we let, if we are rational, we let the evidence, uh, as it were, guide us to our beliefs. We don't f force our beliefs on the evidence. Um, uh, you may say we can do that, but it's not rational. No, you, you can't do that uh, beca you, because if you thought you were, going back to my earlier argument, if you thought you, we were, you were forcing yourself to believe something, then you would realize that you, your belief was independent of how things are. And if you realized your belief was independent of how things are, you wouldn't believe it. If you really thought, I believe this, but I know that I chose to believe this, and I know that I would have chosen to believe this whether or not it was true, <laughs> you wouldn't really believe it. Uh, you believe it because you believe you have been forced to believe it by the evidence. Um, but of course, uh, when we investigate something, um, we uh, look at the alternatives, we weigh the alternatives, and uh, let ourselves be guided by that. And we can choose whether or not to investigate something. We can choose how long to go on investigating something. That's all a matter of choice. We can in uh, choose what we investigate. But once we investigate, the evidence forces us one way or the other. At least that is my picture, and that's my reason why I want to say that. I think Newman uh, uh, was, uh, should have made more of the distinction between believing in and believing that. He was really talking about believing in. So we, we've, you've described um, these three aspects uh, of uh, belief, uh, desire, and intention sort of in, a, in very siloed terms and all of the causality as sort of linear behind them flowing uh, toward intention. But I'm, I'm wondering to what extent you think that the three of them influence each other and to what extent that might... Um well, that goes back really to the previous question. Um, uh, it causally, of course, causally, um, all sorts of things may be happening under the surface that we are not aware of, but the question is, uh, <laughs> which are we aware of? And our intentions uh, will include intentions to go on examining something and see if we get a right belief about it, or we may form an intention to uh, do something about these desires and cut them out to size. And uh, that too we can do. But my, what I said was, at a given time, our desires and beliefs are fixed. That is to say, when I'm forming the intention. Of course, 
over time we can form, change our desires, including, as I say, by the intentions we form. Uh, but at the time, you can't suddenly say, right, I'm going to desire this today. I mean, it, it doesn't. That's not what desires are, it's things you find yourself with. Likewise, you can't really decide to believe that uh, we're now living in the Middle Ages. Uh, you can do it. <laughs> um, and I think the same applies to all, sort, all sorts of beliefs, if you're talking solely about beliefs that. But of course, in the course of time, not merely can you change your beliefs by rational processes, you can, as it were, try and brainwash yourself. But you'll only succeed if you forget that you have tried to brainwash yourself. And that takes a lot of time. <laughs> and, and we just have an extremely short and simple question from uh, Nikolaus of Kostogoda. Yes, thank you. Uh, m my question has uh, three parts. Uh, each, each. Uh, <laughs> it is actually a very simple question. I believe since my question is uh, last, I'll just say uh, after uh, the, the the reply, we'll have probably around fifteen minutes uh, before we have to very politely ask you to leave. So I'll just say it now, uh, because of course this won't be audible uh, with the roaring applause that is going to come uh, at the end. But I was just curious. Um, uh, uh, what you'd or where you'd place uh, um, the idea of whim between desires and moral beliefs, uh, because it would be strange to speak of whim as something that uh, just means that the strongest moral uh, belief prevails. But it seems to me it would also be kind of strange to say that whim can just simply be analysed in terms of the strongest desire prevailing. When someone does something on a whim, it seems to me, uh, at least in sort of the ordinary context, uh, that the person might not be doing something that they, you know, desire most or even particularly desire. That's the, that's, it, it seems to me that's the whole point of doing something on a whim, and yet it's not a case of doing something where you are causally determined to, to do it. It seems, at least in the normal circumstances, to be something like the you know uh, typical expression of being a free agent, to be able to do something on a whim. It's not an external cause that uh, makes you do it, but it's that's neither that's desire. The that, uh, that's, that's the end of the question. So that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you. In, in my uh, classification, a whim does count as a desire. Um, it's a, what makes it a whim is it's a sudden desire to do it, here and now, hasn't been around before, not part of my attitude to life um, uh, in any way, and, but at that time it's what I desire to do most. Short answer to a, to a kind of short question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I'm aware there are a couple more questions in the audience. We do have 15 minutes, as Nikolai said. Uh, we, we don't have longer because we have to hand over the room to the next people making use of it. Uh, but do stick around, grab another drink, and you might be able to ask your question uh, then. Before that, though, if you'd all join me once again in thanking our speaker this evening. Thank you.